You're listening to Passions and Prologues, a literary podcast where each week I'll interview an author about a thing they love and how it inspires their work. My name is Adam Sokol. I'm your host. And today I have a really fun conversation with author Claire North, who also is known as Kate Griffin or Catherine Webb or Kat, as I call her in this discussion. She has a very, very interesting day job. In addition to being an author and uh, published many, many books, uh, Kat also is a lighting designer for live music as her kind of quote unquote day job. Uh, We talk a lot about this, but also specifically her experience with having synesthesia, which is a situation where people who have synesthesia, when they hear music, Uh, They also see shapes or when they hear a sound or a word, it might be connected to a color. Uh, She describes what my voice sounds like to her from a color standpoint in this discussion. Really, really great conversation. Claire is the author of the new book, Ithaca, which we talk about in this discussion. And there's a link in the show notes, but she's also written a ton of other books. So I put a link to her website, clarenorth.com in the show notes as well. You can check out all the books she's written, but Ithaca is really, really fantastic. If you are a fan of Madeline Miller's books like Circe or Song of Achilles, definitely check out Ithaca. You will adore it. In honor of this conversation, I have have two book recommendations I want to talk about. One, a book I'm reading right now, and one, a book that I have just started reading, but it's connected to the synesthesia aspect. And that book is called Three Pianos, a memoir by Andrew McMahon. Andrew McMahon is the lead singer of several bands you may be familiar with, uh, Something Corporate, Jack's Mannequin, and now he's doing his own thing as well. Uh, Andrew McMahon wrote a song called Synesthesia, all about his experience with Billy Joel, who famously has synesthesia. Uh, Andrew wrote this searingly honest and beautiful memoir all about the kind of challenges and triumphs of his own life. Uh, Andrew has gone through a lot in his life in addition to, you know, just growing up a a singer songwriter and as a, a young kid and all the way throughout his career. He also had a very public battle with leukemia in 2005 at the age of 23 and was able to overcome that. But completely changed his perspective in life. So that is the book I am just starting right now, Three Pianos, but Andrew McMahon is one of my favorite musicians of all time. So I wanted to mention that one. And a book I'm just finishing up right now is Killers of a Certain Age by Deanna Rayborn. This is a really fun kind of like murder mystery, but uh, it has a slightly different twist. Basically, there are four older women who have spent their entire lives as assassins, and now they're retiring. And just when they're about to retire, uh, they find out that there's a hit put on them and they're not sure why. And so this is the story of these four 60-year-old women who, again, have an entire history of being assassins, kind of using all of their respective tools and traits and finding out what's going on, why there's a hit on them and how they can overcome it. It's really fun. It's, there's a lot of like, you know, thriller mystery type aspects of it, but in a, with a unique twist. And it's very funny the way that these four women interact with each other. Highly recommend it. Uh, I am realizing over the past month or so that I'm a big fan of cozy mysteries. And I feel like this falls right in there. So that's Killers of a Certain Age by Deanna Rayborn. And again, all those links will be in the show notes. Okay. As a reminder, if you want any book recommendations from me customized for you, just leave me a review wherever it is that you listen to the podcast, Spotify, Apple, whatever it is, how, you know, helps people find it a little bit more easily and takes you about five seconds to do it. Send a screenshot of that review to passionsandprologues at gmail.com. That's how you can get a hold of me. Uh, I will give you some book recommendations. Okay. Really, really excited. I am going to transition smoothly into my conversation with Claire North on passions and prologues. Hey, everybody, it's Adam again, and I am really, really excited for the conversation that you're about to listen to. I am joined by Catherine Webb, who you may know by a couple different names. She has a book out that we're going to talk a little bit later under one of her pen names, Claire North. But before we get into the books and writing and all that fun stuff, first off, Kat, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And so what is the passion that you have that we're going to be talking about today? Oh, I had a whole list. Which would you prefer of my many, many special interests? 
We'll tell you what, let's, let's go with uh, the lighting design and kind of the like live music industry and all that stuff. Cause I think it's something a, that not a lot of other people are going to be involved in that who also happen to be authors and two, it's super, super interesting. So, so let's go with like that lighting design aspect. So first, like, how did you get into lighting design as a career and, and in the live music industry, kind of like walk me through how that all happened. So I've always been interested in technical things. You know how as a kid, sometimes you're sent to like the after school drama club and everyone's acting and you're acting out the plays about what it means to be bullied and how bullying is bad. Mm -hmm. Even as like a 10 year old, I knew I just wanted to sit by the lighting desk and move Mm -hmm. all the funny looking knobs. Um, And so when I went to school, the very good drama teacher allowed me to do the technical course on the drama course rather than the acting course, which no one had ever done before. And it was kind Mm -hmm. of quite a controversial thing because the school was all about good grades and high marks. And so letting someone muck around with plywood was Mm -hmm. just unprecedented. Um, So I'm very grateful to him. And so I did the technical module, but everyone was like, you do need to get a proper job and have a real life. And I know I'm a writer and I was even a writer back then, but writing is not a proper job. It's just, mm-hmm. it, it does not count as reliable employment. You need to be a lawyer, a dentist, a plumber, something, you know, that thinks about your parents' <laughs> futures. So I went off and did history at London School of Economics. But even while there, I really liked doing the lights. Um, Mm -hmm. And at the LSE, I was shown quite early on that the way you got access to the dimmer room where all the control equipment was, was by asking for the key and the key not being left. And you tried to get the key in an emergency and it's still not being left. And then you'd be learn that the way you actually got in was by forcing the door to the dimmer room using a Boots loyalty card. So I became head of all things technical for the Mm -hmm. LSE while I was there because I was willing to use a Boots loyalty card to just shimmy my way into the dimmer room. (laughs) Um, So I did that. And at the end of that, I was like, well, I could still go and get a proper job and be a grown up and use this degree. Or I could go to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts, RADA, also known as Radi Da, um, to do technical theatre. So I did that and I went off and specialised in lighting. I love that part of your journey is some light breaking and entering, just like a little bit of <laughs> break teensy bit of breaking an entry but I only did it in emergencies and I followed all proper procedures beforehand like I'd contact the people who had the key they'd confirm they'd leave the key they never left the key you'd have audiences filing in and under I think those emergency circumstances a teensy little bit of emergency breaking and entering was not unreasonable so I when I was in high school I was also in like theater programs and theater productions our theater classes that I would take throughout the day, instead of like doing lighting design, ours was always like, do this monologue from an Arthur Miller play or uh, bring in a monologue from one of your favorite movies, like Google Hunting and poorly act it out on stage and act like, you know, you're Robin Williams and it never went well for anybody. But I, I love, I've always been a person and my parents who I know listen to these episodes will laugh. I love being the center of attention. I'm the youngest of four. So I like crave attention. And so it made sense for me why I wanted to be on a stage where no one else was there talking at you for seven minutes. It's also why I'm now a podcaster, but I'm curious, what was it for you about lighting design that like you were talking about, you, you knew you wanted to be right away. One of the people kind of messing with those knobs and changing the way that the visuals were on, on stage. What was it about that that instantly struck you as a thing that you knew you wanted to spend time doing? I think it's a mixture of things. Firstly, it excites a part of my brain that I don't necessarily get to use when writing. There's a lot of thinking about maths and angles and the physics of it and calculating power. And I, I like having that part of the brain ticking over as well as the novel writing part. That feels quite exciting. I love theatre, but I can't act for Toffee. And I knew I wanted to be involved, but I just did not want to be on a stage at all. Sure. And so that naturally meant finding a behind the scenes thing to do. And one of the good things about the RADA course is it made you do every single department and then you'd choose which department excited mm. me the most, which production role made me be all tingly with the excitement of live performance. Mm. And it was lighting. I think also I have synesthesia, um, which is the thing where essentially wires get a bit crossed in your brain. So I feel light as a three-dimensional object. A light for me has, it has texture and it has shape. I can feel whether a color is solid or squishy or soft or metallic or leathery. It has a real physical sense for it. And doing lighting, making pictures out of light, it, it has a, a, a music to it almost. It's not like hearing Beethoven, but you can hear when the music is wrong and when it's right. And when it's right, the music is 
very beautiful. Again, I can't draw for toffee, but I, I really like combining colors in the air and in a space and kind of creating those forms that have, for me, a taste to them. You can taste good light. And so I think in that particular case, the cross wires in my brain, this kind of synthesis mm-hmm. wires, really lent themselves towards going yum, 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 like, like, <laughs> like. I have a hundred questions I want to ask you. First off, I, I told you before I started recording, I really wanted to ask you about synesthesia because as I said, I think the majority of people who have ever heard of it have heard of it because Billy Joel, the famous singer and piano man has synesthesia. And then there's actually, there's another musician that I love. His name is Andrew McMahon who wrote a song called synesthesia about his interactions with Billy Joel. So it's like, everything goes back to Billy Joel and anyone thinks of synesthesia. And there's a line in there that says, I I hear colors when I see your voice. And I'm curious because I obviously, I don't have synesthesia. I, I can't taste or like hear colors or interact with them in a different, like in a different way. So for people who may not understand how your brain works and that would probably be most of us, can you maybe explain like when you're watching a production or you're, you're doing lighting for production, like what that feels like when, you know, the, the mood or the color changes on, on stage. And then as a lighting professional, how you use that to kind of affect other people's experience of the show? That's a big question and I'm sorry, but <laughs> it I, is I'm a super big curious. question. I'll give it my best shot. It's not like it's a visual interference. It's not like I'm living my life on LSD. Mm -hmm. It's more just like an absolute knowing. So like your voice when I hear it is a kind of sky blue bubble wrap. I I can hear, I can, it it just is. Mm -hmm. And it feels quite nice. You can sort of, do you remember growing up, this is going to date me. Do you remember this kind of Windows 3.1 screensavers? Or like the background you got on Windows Media Player, that kind of psychedelic Mm -hmm. background. If I just sit with a sensation, I can hear the thing or I can see the thing. And then I can feel essentially what it would be like as a Windows 3.1 screen so essentially I can sort of feel that shape and that color and again it's not visually interfering but it's just an absolute certainty of obviously this is what it is and my family has it so my mum and I often disagree on what color words are I'm mm-hmm. certain that Wednesday is green and my mum thinks it's red which is she's clearly wrong um, <laughs> so it's not like there's a universal pattern for how you experience it. everyone experiences it in a different way and they have it on different things so that's how I experience it. And I, and a lot of people experience it in very different ways. In terms of theatre work, I'm not sure how much it influenced me in as much as in theatre, your job is to til- still be telling a story. The mm-hmm. lighting is helping to tell a story. You are attempting to heighten an emotion or capture an emotion or convey a narrative with your lighting. And most of the time people don't notice until it's gone wrong. Mm-hmm. So you're not doing anything wacky or exciting necessarily with the lights if it's just a straight up, if it's just wrecked and people stood on stage talking like this, then it's, you're, you're using light to capture the emotion. But I feel emotions in color as well. Like it's very hard for me to tell you at any given moment, whether I feel happy or sad or greedy or whatever it is, an emotion I'm feeling. I can tell you that I feel lilac or mm-hmm. I feel bright green. Um, so in that sense, it made total sense for me for lighting to try and help convey an emotion. But I also, and mostly these days, in fact, do music gigs. And in music gigs, I think it comes in much more powerfully because you can hear an emotion in the song and you can hear its power in a rhythm. And then it's nice to be able to kind of immediately go to the snap decision of, okay, I feel this color. And you don't necessarily want to do it in the sense of this song sounds orange, so I'll make it orange because color has cultural meaning. Mm -hmm. If someone is singing a song about how their mother died of an overdose and everyone was very sad, you're not necessarily going to pump out the magenta and spin the mirror ball, but you're going to have almost a a full sensory experience of what that emotion is. You're not just hearing the words and hearing the sound. You're feeling the words and feeling the sound of this song about death and overdose. You're Mm -hmm. feeling it physically. And I think that helps with making quick decisions that are strong. Most of live music lighting is about making a quick decision that is reasonably strong and then sticking to it as though you meant it, even if it's a mistake. There's There's a lot of blag in live music lighting. Um, and I think the thing that you see a, a lot of the time that makes you sad in live music is people double guessing their decisions. People kind of go, oh, I'm not sure what I'm doing with this. I'm just going to make it blue. And actually the best lighting designers just own it. It's like, well, I'm doing this now. We're going to make it work somehow. And so I think having that full physical sense of music and lights 
is probably one of my few strengths as a lighting designer for live music, less so for theatre. Yeah, I... <laughs> First off, uh, listeners of the podcast will know I, in an earlier episode, I talked about the Muppets with uh, an author, Brad Meltzer. I'm obsessed with the Muppets. I always have been. And what's sticking in my head right now is just Kermit saying it's not easy being green. Like this is all I can think of, which has nothing. That's green to do. is the color of spring. Exactly. Yeah, I'm here for this song. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm super interested. I'm fascinated by like the background of how, you know, when you're going to be lighting, like you said, you're, you're doing mostly like musical performances now. What is the process of this for you? Is it you're working with one specific band at different locations or is it you're working at one location and, and different bands are coming in for, you know, a gig one night or maybe a week long residency, whoever it might be. How does the process work? Like, do you sit down with them ahead of time and say, this is what I have in mind or is it, taking their suggestions and then politely saying, okay, but I'm a professional. I actually know what I'm doing. Like, how does the process work? I'm so fascinated by this. Um, this is going to be so disappointing for so many people as oh, they no. realize how their beloved bands are winging it. Um, yeah. I am mainly a venue lighting engineer. So I work in a couple of venues and people come into the space. Very rarely, I would say one in 10 times, I have people come up to me and say, oh, you're the lighting engineer. Could you make it this? Very, very rarely. And if they do come up to me, most of the time what they do is they come up and say, yeah, so no red. You're like, what? No red. You're like, okay, I guess no red. And of those one in 10 times, I would say six out of 10 times, that's what you're getting. People saying no strobe, no haze, no red. And a lot of the time, the reasons for that are not always the best. A lot of the time they'll have gone to venues and they'll have had bad experiences with lighting. They'll mm. have been drowned in smoke. They'll have been strobed out too much. They'll, they'll have just, they'll have had a really bad experience and they'll be saying these things to protect themselves. And I fully understand that. Mm. But it is a bit frustrating if you feel like you're a competent lighting designer who's going to do a good job to then be told, no, none of you may not, you may not touch this because Bob in Lyme Regis did a bad job. So now it is banned. Um, but that's still only six out of 10 from the one out of 10 who do actually come to you. Mm -hmm. Very, very rarely you'll get people come to the lighting desk and go, there's this lovely thing I'd like to try and hit because it's very, very hard to actually hit specific targets if you've never heard the band before, mm -hmm. which you haven't. Um, so one of my all-time favorite musicians is a woman called Nadine Shah, who is fantastic and magnificent. And I did a show for her and she came up to me at the beginning of the sound check and was like, okay, so it's, it's this one song and right at the beginning it goes, da-da, 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 and can you hit that? And I was petrified because I had no idea where this was going to happen. But at least it was a very clear direction. You're listening mm -hmm. to a really obvious da, da And I missed the first one and then got the remainders of them. And that's mm -hmm. a lot of your experience of lighting design. A lot of your experience of lighting design is songs you've never heard, songs that might not even have been released on the internet yet. So you've got no way of hearing them mm -hmm. before the show starts. Hoping that you'll hear something really strong you can latch into and then hoping you'll be able to predict when it's going to stop and trying your very best to ride that wave. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, my personal nemesis is prog rock because prog rock has this habit of building and building and building and building. As you're said 10 minutes into a song, you're going, okay, it's a full volume, strobe, spin, lights, ah! And every fader is up and every effect you've got is running. And then they keep going and you're just mm -hmm. sat there going, well, I got nothing. I have, I have no idea. And then they stop. You're like, oh my God, stop. And then they start again. You're like, oh my God. Yeah. And have about four or five false endings. They go, da-da. Like, that was it. And then they go, da-da. You're like, oh, it wasn't it. Da-da. Like, oh. And it's just, you spend every prog rock gig with your finger poised over the blackout button thinking, is this, am I? And then you don't trust your own judgment. And then it does stop. And the lights are still up. You're just like, I just, I just wish. I just wish I knew. Long story, that was a long story, but long story short is that in venues, a lot of the time, you are winging it. Mm -hmm. um, I will try and listen to as much music of the band I possibly can before sound check. But even then, recording yeah. music, very different from live music. A lot of the time, the songs they're playing are not released. Maybe you'll get a set list. Mm -hmm. I will sometimes ask for a set list with notes, even a smiley face or a sad face. I, I will take any yeah. clues I can get particularly if it's a band who are performing in a language I don't speak, like if they're performing in Portuguese or Farsi. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea whether this bimbly happy rhythm is actually exactly. a happy sound or whether yeah. the lyrics are like, and then they died and there was incest. <laughs> so you're, you're winging it. You're really, 
clinging on by the seat yeah. of your pants and hoping for the best. Just thinking like an LCD sound system song that's like nine minutes long. And you're like, oh my God, okay, we've gone through seven different cycles here. What's going on? We'll be back with more passions and prologues after this break. Women's Running Stories, where we explore the intersection between running and life. Because every woman who is committed to a running journey has a story to tell, and this is where you'll find those stories. I am host and producer Sheree Louise Turner. I'm a 53-year-old runner, and together with original music by musician and runner Cormac O'Regan, we bring these inspirational stories to life. Please join us to fuel your adventures. And now, back to Bastions and Prologues. When you're listening to music on you know, Spotify or Apple Music, wherever you're listening to it, do you, I'll frame this, as a person who interviews people, I listen to interview podcasts all the time. And I will either think about how, like there's a there's a Maximum Fun podcast called Bullseye. It's also on National Public Radio here in, in the States. And Jesse Thorne is the host. And I think he's a wonderful interviewer. I will find myself thinking when I listen to him, what questions I would ask and also how I would answer his questions because I'm a gigantic podcast nerd and that's why I love doing this. When you're listening to music, do you either because of your synesthesia or just because of your job, do you find yourself thinking like, oh, this is, this would look great with, you know, X color or like Y lighting aspect, or is it just because of the way that the synesthesia is in your mind, you're just like naturally seeing or hearing colors. I'm, I feel like I'm really butchering the way to describe this. No, no, I fully understand the question. A bit of both. I tend to like music that is lightable, if that mm-hmm. makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't really like rap because I find it very hard to hear the lyrics a lot of the time. And if I can't latch on to what's happening emotionally, I don't get that synesthetic experience. Mm-hmm. I, I, I just hear sound and it doesn't have color or shape to me. But if the music has a dynamic range that feels lightable, I will immediately start feeling it as a physical thing and as a synesthetic thing. Mm -hmm. Um, So I tend to automatically listen to music that I'd like to light anyway. And yeah, I I will sit there and I will be feeling it as a physical thing, but then the part of professional brain also comes in as like, okay, what would I do with this? What's, what would move? What would not move? Where's the build? Where's, where's the traps almost like, okay, it's building now, but what would you have to be ready to pull out for the drops? Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, there's there's both the feeling of it physically and the professional mindset. I also quite like watching with the sound down stuff like Strictly Come Dancing, which I don't know if you get. I have no interest in the drama behind the scenes. I don't have a huge amount of interest in the dancing, but it's fascinating watching the lights and seeing the toys and seeing what other people are doing with it. Same thing with Eurovision. I have no interest in Eurovision whatsoever. But from a technical point of view, you look at it, you're just like, oh, that effect. Oh, that's all. Oh, look at the toys. Yum, yum, yeah. yum, yum, yum. And it's it's often beautiful. The music is often dreadful, but the lighting is often gorgeous. You just mm-hmm. sit there, oh, you dribble. <laughs> so when it comes to a scale like that from a lighting design, because Eurovision is like, it's massive. I mean, even in the States here, it's- we know... It's enormous. So from a lighting design, like for something like that, because like you were saying, you, you're lighting venues and a lot of the times, like like you said, you, you're trying to listen to music ahead of time, but really it's you probably get these people in their sound check, which could be 20 minutes, could be an hour, could, however long that band wants to do it. And that's the time you have with them. But for a thing of that scale, like Eurovision, or say if you're going to do like um, like a West End musical or something like can you walk people through the difference we've seen because i don't think people quite understand the scope of how much would go into like a major production like that like what is the difference between doing a smaller maybe like 300 person venue for a band that's on tour versus like phantom of the opera in residency which is probably has its own theater built for it with (laughs) 2200 people in there so it, it really varies. So I'm, for context, in venues that have about a 900, 1,000 person cap. So even at that size, we're still kind of winging it. In something like Eurovision, we're talking teams of hundreds mm-hmm. fitting up a rig weeks in advance. Like it's, a, it's a massive, massive job to get something like that ready. Um, 
And sometimes you can get on massive events, in fact, most massive events, so if you take an arena event, we'll bring a, a production team. And the production team will spend months thinking about, okay, we need this truss here, we need that truss there. This is going to fly at this point. How is this going to work with that? And that's a much more heavily pre-programmed, pre-designed, everything incredibly thoroughly plotted out and worked on, time-coded even mm -hmm. experience. So if you're in an arena, you are looking at months of planning, days of programming. You're looking at a huge amount of work by a vast number of people. With Eurovision, the rumor I heard, I still don't know if this is true, was that every country is essentially given three options for their lighting. So the lighting is programmed. They can come and see their three different options. They pick the one they like. I don't know if that still happens, but the implication of that is that it is still just an unfortunate hapless program and designer sat at a desk going, okay, well, let's put something in here and hope mm -hmm. for the best. But at least you know what the song is. You know what you're designing to. Um, and if I was designing on a Eurovision scale, a two and a half minute song to do it in real fine detail is several hours of work to do it well. It's a, it's a, and that's just the programming. Like it's a lot of work to get two and a half minutes right. The other part that you get is touring. So I've done a bit of touring and you have the advantage there that you know the music. Mm -hmm. So you'll go into a venue, you'll know what the songs are, but you might not know the venue. So yeah. even if you know the music, you're going to spend the six hours or however much it is you have struggling to find a way to translate that into a completely new lighting rig and for the sound engineer, a completely new sound system. So even though you might think, oh, while you're on tour, you can just tour the same show file. You absolutely can't. You are in every single venue struggling with, well, this is very high. This is very low. This is very white. This is very wide. This is dreadful. This is great. Um, I did the Grassroots Festival once. You get 15 minutes on the lighting desk between shows to just Nay, you think it's more time on the pyramid stage. So I was on the park stage, which was about 2,000 people. 15 minutes, you walk in, you, you do your best. There's a desk with stuff already pre programmed, and then you're off. And that's broadcast on BBC One. It's a huge event. And you're just like, well, again, we are still winging it. So that's the live music side. Musicals like Les Mis and Phantom of the Opera, completely different. Again, completely different way of working. It's madness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was thinking when you're talking about live music, like, depending on the size of the band, like you said, it might be you're doing, they might do a festival one night or one afternoon. They might go to a, like you said, a, an arena, they might do a amphitheater. And not only, like you said, is the stage and size of the area different, but it might be inside. It might be outside. It might be, you know, dusk. It might be night. It might like, depending yeah. on, oh man, that's, I, 15 minutes. I, I feel like I'm just like blown away by the amount of things you have to get done. Like I just, cause I feel like when you go see a live show, like you said, specifically music, because like you said musicals, they can at least plan out those things in advance. Even if it's a touring musical, like they at least have more than 15 minutes to plan. Like when you see a live show, I, I am just thinking to like all the live music I've seen in my life and like it, the lighting adds so much to it, but people probably don't realize how much of this goes into it. It's just yeah. so fascinating. People only see it when it goes wrong. Something like a musical, you can have been in tech. So you could have been with actors on the stage working on every cue for two weeks. Mm -hmm. Like some musicals can take literally two weeks to tech and then several more weeks of preview. And I have done that and it's exhausting because you arrive at 10 a.m. and you work till 10, 10, 30 at night, mm -hmm. um, to just 12 hours straight. I did one week where I got 15 minutes break in the entire week oh. um, because you're just trying to pump out lighting state after lighting state. And that's not live. That's all recorded before the audience comes in. But to get it right, to make the lights sync with the singing, to sync with the action, to sync with the sound, to sync with everything else, sync with the set, you will spend literally weeks sat mm -hmm. in the darkness running and rerunning and rerunning the same thing over and over again until it's perfect, which is a completely different kettle of fish from live music and has, a, it has amazing perks. You can produce some incredible things with this, but it's also differently exhausting because the amount of time you just spend running Q70, running Q70, running Q70, tweaking 5% up, 5% down, running it again. Mm -hmm. It's snackering. Yeah, I can only imagine. And I'm really interested because, again, you are also, like you said, I hesitate to even say on the side because you are a writer. Like, I feel like you have two full time lives. So you have written so many books. And, and I'm interested, and like you said, like from the time back to when you're 14, you were having novels published. Does the experience of your quote unquote day job, which is ironic, is probably actually more so a night job, but for the sake of 
you know, syntax for like your quote unquote day job and your writing job. Is there any like overlap? Like, do you think your thought process from a lighting standpoint, uh, the synesthesia aspect, like how does all that play into your writing process? They're both fundamentally about telling stories. At Mm -hmm. the end of the day, if the lighting is not helping to convey an emotional arc, then it's bad lighting. Even in music, the, Mm -hmm. the lighting is there to help carry a meaning and carry an emotion. So they're both just a different form of storytelling. I have the synesthesia with the writing, obviously. I can hear whether the sentence is beautiful or colorful or whether it's an oval or whether it's a rectangle of a sentence. Mm -hmm. Um, So it all squishes together. Um, I think, to be honest, the most valuable part of the lighting for me, well, it's got several valuable parts as regards the writing. I think if you just write every single day, you go mad. So Mm -hmm. it's incredibly important to get out of the house and do other things. I think if you just write every single day, it's hard to meet other people, Mm -hmm. frankly, and get other experiences. And live music and theatre both introduce me to new people all the time, but also have forced me to go to places that otherwise I might not have gone to, which is good. But also, I think probably the single most useful thing about the lighting in terms of how it relates to the writing. Am I allowed to swear? Absolutely. It keeps you from becoming a bit of a pillock. And that's a very mild swear. I'll swear more now I've got that out of the way. But um, with both music and with writing, you are creating something subjective. Mm -hmm. Um, There is no objective way to measure whether this is the best song or this is the best book or what best even means. Yeah. It's all very much according to taste. Mm -hmm. And there's no real objective measure of whether success means anything. Maybe you got paid more money for this song or maybe you had a bigger audience at this gig. But that will pass. That could just be a fad. That could be meaningless tomorrow. And I think as a writer, it's very easy to get trapped trying to find your self-worth in your output, trying to go, well, I wrote this book and my value as a human being is dependent on its success. And when you work in technical theatre, you see people do that all the time. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the time, technicians are treated like shit. Um, You're not considered valuable. You're not considered worth anyone's time or humanity. And you see bad behaviour. And I think it is unbelievably important and useful to be reminded on a regular basis that no art, no production, be it music, be it writing, be it anything, is worth behaving badly for. Mm -hmm. And that no one has ever, ever thrived from investing their self-worth in something as subjective as what we will loosely call art. And so I think the word people often use is grounded. I don't like to say lighting has kept me grounded, but there is something about crawling underneath a stage through rap P trying to diagnose a 63 three-phase fault at 8 p.m. with the audience rushing in that does make you think, well, yeah, I've got priorities Uh and I know where I am and I've made this choice. And I think that has been valuable, to be honest. I think that's probably helped me stay human-ish as a writer. From a writing standpoint, I'm really interested in, like you said, kind of, you can see if a sentence, like you said, is like rectangular or oval or squishy, which is my favorite word that I think (laughs) you'd use to describe it. There's, uh, I have an author friend who, she's Welsh, her name is Dawn Kurtagic, and she writes some young adult horror, some adult horror, but she writes very spooky books. And she doesn't have synesthesia, but she has told me that one of her books is her yellow book and one of her books is her red book and she wants to write a rainbow of books. And to me, they're just all very creepy, wonderful, wonderfully written books. But she doesn't, she, like I said, she doesn't have synesthesia, but she just decided like, this is my yellow book. And I'm not really, she's ever explained to me why it's her yellow book, but it makes sense to her. For you, knowing that the overwhelming majority of people who read your books aren't seeing the words and the and the paragraphs and the sentences the same way that you're interacting with them does that affect how you're you're writing or how you're conveying a specific story or is it just you know you're going to see it a certain way and you just want the story to be a story that people enjoy reading and interacting with honestly and this could sound bad but I don't think it is no it doesn't affect how I write Mm -hmm. again you could spend a lot of time as a writer trying to guess what people will enjoy Mm -hmm. But the honest truth is if you write something you enjoy to the best of your ability and you had fun doing it, that will always be a lot better than trying to bulldoze yourself into writing what you think people would like and having a horrid time doing it. Mm -hmm. The golden rule of writing is to always prioritize writing something you will love. Mm -hmm. Because if you loved it, that love will drip through 
regardless. And the whole point of books is that everyone reads something different. It doesn't matter whether you have synesthesia. It doesn't matter who or where you are. Every single person will have a different experience reading any book that's ever been written under the sun. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of the magic of it. Okay, but do you get to be a little more hands-on with like your covers? Because so you have a you have a, a new book that I'm that done a horrible job promoting for you so far, but Ithaca, which again by is under Claire North, your one of your pen names. The cover that I'm looking at is orange with kind of like a gold, and then Ithaca herself is sort of like white. And there's black. It's and I'll let you talk about the actual book as well, obviously. But do you get to say like, no, that this this needs to be orange or like this needs to be blue? Like, do you do any of that or no? Um, I don't really. Um, it's not my craft and it's not my skill. Um, just because I feel things doesn't mean I have the craft or the skill to say that that's right. At the end mm-hmm. of the day, making a cover is a very high art form that is about appealing to a certain demographic. And I am a big fan of respecting the craft of the people who do that. Mm -hmm. I will put my foot down occasionally and say, that is an ugly cover that I do not feel achieves your commercial objective. Um, But the key part is not the ugly. It's the, what is your commercial objective? And I only say that because I've been doing this for 22 years. A lot of the time writers can be very difficult about their covers. Say, I hate this cover. It doesn't reflect what I imagined at all. But the immortal sentence it's not how I imagined, but I don't know how to fix it, is the bane of all lighting designers. Mm -hmm. It's the bane of all artists. It's the bane of anyone ever who's ever done anything creative at all. It's the bane of actors. Darling, there's something wrong with your speech, but I don't know what it is. Unless you have an actual statement that has any value to follow it up, just just don't, just don't. Mm -hmm. Only say those words if you have something constructive to add at the end of it. Um, So I only ever weighed in on my covers if I have something meaningful and constructive right at the end of it. My editor might not agree. My editor be like, Kat, you've given me such hell over these years. And I apologize if that's the case, but I try my very, very best mm-hmm. to leave people to their highly skilled work. Mm-hmm. I my my day job is I'm in marketing for a tech company and I know some of them listen and they're all wonderful and I love my company so much. But every once in a while I do get one of those notes in like a in a white paper, an ebook that I've written with it, it'll be like, this isn't quite working for me. I'm like, what part? Give me more feedback to that. But again, it's rare, but you're absolutely right. When someone's just like, this isn't, um, I'm not really enjoying this book cover. I'm like, what about it? I don't know. It's, um, it's oof. Like, no, th- please more notes than that. <laughs> Big shout out to um, Lisa Marie Pompilio. If you're wondering who designed this cover, I think it's very, very sexy and important to shout out the genius behind it. Absolutely. Yeah, it's gorgeous. So so tell our listeners a little bit about Ithaca as a, a person who is very, very big into like Greek mythology and, and Greek tales. And I was very excited when this came across my email. So tell our <laughs> oh, listeners about Ithaca and why you wanted to write this story. Okay, let's see if I can do this properly. I'm so bad at pitching my own books, but let's see if I can do this. Um, so Ithaca is the story of Penelope, the wife of Odysseus. And the basic premise is Odysseus sails off to Troy. He's at Troy for 10 years, and then he vanishes. He's gone for another 10 years after that. And in his absence, Penelope is famously beset by suitors and has to manage her kingdom. And in the Odyssey, she spends most of her time weeping in her room and being beset by suitors. Mm -hmm. But if you actually stop for a second and look at this with your geopolitical hat on, she has a massive political problem. And the thing that reminded me of is the problem of Elizabeth I. Elizabeth I, Queen of England, Everyone wanted her to marry. But if she marries the king of France, that means war with Spain. If she marries the king of Spain, that means war with France. If she marries the king of Denmark, that means war with Catholic world. If she marries a domestic English lord, that means war with all the other domestic English lords. But neither can she say no to any of these people because if you say no to France, France will invade. No to Spain, Spain will invade. Mm. No to an English person, there'll be a civil war. And so Elizabeth I spent her entire reign going, Mm, I'll let you know. And it strikes me that this is 100% what Penelope is doing. Mm-hmm. Penelope spends a good 10 years in her husband's absence going, oh, I'm just, oh, you're really nice, but I'm just not sure. Mm-hmm. And she has to, politically, to protect the kingdom of Ithaca, Penelope has to manipulate and control the situation so that nothing can quite change. She has to maintain this incredibly delicate balance of power, almost this cold war between all these factions who want control of the kingdom. And she has to do it 
in a very misogynist environment in which women are considered dangerous Mm -hmm. because the only other women around at this time of any significance are Clytemnestra, who murders Agamemnon, and Helen, who runs away to Troy. And in this environment, therefore, she cannot be seen to have power because a woman with power is so dangerous. So she has to protect this kingdom all the time while pretending to be a little weak, weebly woman who runs to a room. And people are not passive about trying to take it from her. Everyone wants to seize it as his kingdom. And so it's, it was an attempt to write a book and indeed a trilogy about ruling a land while pretending that you're not and mm-hmm. maintaining a peace by keeping everyone on the hook and the espionage and the diplomacy and the cunning that has to go into just keeping that balance, that incredibly delicate balance of power in the mm-hmm. Western kingdoms. That's the book. I yeah, I think you did a great job. I love it. And that, Thank you. Absolutely. I'm I'm interested as the person who spent so much time with it. What is it about these Greek myths that you think still hits us as a modern society? Because obviously, there's you know Madeline Miller's books, and there's Jennifer Saint's Ariadne. Like, there's these books that are extensions of these Greek stories that are you know centuries and centuries and centuries old but they still stick with us and we're still all fascinated by the Iliad and the Odyssey and the like these quote-unquote minor characters who then get you know extended on in books like yours and Circe and these different things like what is it about these stories that you think continues to fascinate us all as readers? I think there's two parts of that. I firstly think that the Greek canon massively shaped Western literature in very obvious ways. Like it's mm-hmm. tropes, it's stories. They are comforting and familiar to us because mm-hmm. they have literally shaped everything that followed forever. Um, and they combine at, at one hand kind of gods and monsters and heroes and all of that with a stark domesticity, frankly, bickering mm-hmm. marrying couples and adultery and child abuse, so much child abuse, so, so much so abuse. Much child abuse. Like, my God, just every, it's so problematic. But anyway, so they are stories that we sort of almost feel like a warm, familiar thing. Um, mm-hmm. And they're also, by that extension, you can kind of do a shorthand with them. You don't need to do the fantasy thing of having to explain Zeus. You don't need to have to spend 10 pages on world building. You can go, and then Zeus. And people are like, okay, I'm fairly comfortable with what yeah. that means. Um, so I think that's part of it. But I also think that one of the reasons we're interested in retelling is almost the same reason we're interested in constantly putting Hamlet on again. Hamlet's been performed gazillion times for the last 500 and something years, more than that, a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's not that there's anything new in Hamlet. It's not that we're about to put on a new version, but every time we perform it, what we're doing is reflecting our culture now. Yes, Mm. we're using Shakespeare, but the way we do it is reflecting who we are now. So Hamlet may have evolved from being the tragic boy child who we all love to being a mentally disturbed young man to being an absolute pillar who we all hate. Like he evolves through our cultural eyes. And that's how we look at the Greek myths. They are constantly being looked at, not because they've changed, but because we have. Our Mm. culture has changed, which means how we look at them has changed. 30, 40 years ago, I don't think anyone was really interested in talking about how Zeus is a rapey shit. Mm -hmm. My God, we were not interested in talking about the inherent misogyny in all of that and the tropes that it created, the toxic, toxic tropes it created about what womanhood is and what masculine strength is and kind of these archetypes, Hercules with his muscles who also kills his wife and kids Mm -hmm. and is redeemed because of his muscles. We don't, we weren't interested in that now. And now our culture is interested in these myths because our culture and who we are has changed. So I think a lot of the retellings reflect the fact that as a culture, we're now looking back at these stories and go, oh, wait, wait a second. Mm-hmm. Um, and not changing the stories, but changing how we look at them. And I find that interesting. And that's always going to happen. In another hundred years, there'll be another surge of retellings of ancient stories through another cultural lens that will see something completely different. And if there wasn't, we would have stagnated as a species. I really love that. And, and it's it's interesting. It's not even Greek retellings because like you said like there's countless retellings or reimaginings of fairy tales in fact there's a couple authors who have come on who have written some of them Kaylin Bayron is one she wrote a, a book called Cinderella's Dead and like there's these different reimaginings of these stories and I think you're absolutely right like it's a way to 
tell a more modern story with more like the modern emotions and, and realizations of things, but also in an established world where, like you said, you don't have to be like, okay, so the brothers Grimm, let me tell you about them. It's like, no, we get it. We know who they are. We know the stories they wrote and like, we get it. And yeah, I, I think that's really, I've never thought about that in the point where like you can say like, all right, I'm going to tell you why these people were kind of assholes and I don't have to explain the world to you first. I'm going to just say like, so there was this guy and he got on a boat. His name was Odysseus. You know who he is. I really, that's such an interesting way of thinking about it. It also allows us to poke at things that we may have just taken for granted and internalized. Odysseus, what a great guy, sails to Troy, burns the city to the ground, gets off with lots of women on his way home, but we expect Penelope to remain this chaste, pure widow weeping for him in a corner. And it's like we take so many of the old stories for granted and don't think about how they have shaped our understanding Mm -hmm. of what it is to be, say, male or female. And they have. These stories always shape our understanding of what these gender roles mean. And it's quite nice in a way that we get to go back and poke at them and go, oh, but, 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 but. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's, that's such a, such a great point. Um, all right. Last question for you. I'm always asking every author just for a recommendation of something. It can be, it can be a book. Lots of people have given books. It can be a TV show. It could be a band. Uh, I had an author who came on on the first episode. We talked about powerlifting, which was her passion. And she, uh, she recommended a protein powder. So anything that you are enjoying that you think needs a little more light shined on it, like what is something that you really love that other people should know about? Again, can be a book if you want. No judgment if it is. Obviously, it was a literary podcast. If I was to do a book, then I've been reading and ranting about a book called How Emotions Are Made by Lisa Feldman Barrett, which is a brilliant deconstruction of how human brains work and incredibly readable and wonderful and mind shattering in a good way. If I was to be full nerd on you, I really like chess. Go play chess. Mm -hmm. Chess is great. Chess is wonderful fun. I mean, it's a savage game of deconstruction, but it's also beautiful. Mm -hmm. I love that's perfect chess just in general what a great that's uh, that might be my favorite recommendation so far chess (laughs) yes go play chess guys millennia old board game that's perfect oh this was so much fun and so fascinating Kat thank you for joining me today thank you so much for having me Passions and Prologues is proud to be an evergreen podcast and was created by Adam Sokol it was produced by Adam Sokol and Sean Rule Hoffman. And if you are interested in this podcast and any other Evergreen podcast, you can go to evergreenpodcast.com to discover all the different stories we have to tell. 